Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. We're in a city that keeps the stages everywhere, magic with the sounds of great playwrights. But playwright Tony Kushner's voice is so special because he strives to transform the theater and at the same time change the world. That's quite a, a task, isn't it? Yeah, I'm not entirely sure that it's what I'm trying to do. All oh, right, uh, well, it sounds good. <laughs> but you do say, I mean, you're a working artist. Yes. And a playwright. Yeah. And and, an, and a, a screenwriter So creative, now. you're everything, right? You write children's books, screenplays, everything else. I mean, and you are so creative, it just pours out of you. Well, you sort of. It. It I does. mean, I, it's, yeah. That's so way. lucky. It's, uh, it's, but it's hard work, I mean, and, and I struggle with it a lot, so I, I don't know that I feel, I mean, there are periods where uh, I seem to do a lot of work all at once, and then there are periods like this where uh, work is just, you know, kind of like chipping away at, at limestone and flint day after day. Is that because day. you're working on projects that you had already thought of? Um, I don't really know what the answer is. I think that there sometimes um, a, a particular project, uh, the one that I'm working on now, is a screenplay for Steven Spielberg about Abraham Lincoln, and it's very hard. It may be the hardest thing I've ever tried to do, and uh, it's been a, a two and a half, two years now, not two and a half, two years of of, of grinding away at it. And it's I think the, the vastness of the subject and uh, the complexity of the subject and the political and ideological complexity of the subject. And um, the fact that it's a screenplay, this is only my third screenplay, so it's still sort of a new form. All of that uh, is making it kind of slow going. And, um, and, and when I'm really struggling with, with one thing, nothing else happens, including the rest of my life. Everything comes to a halt. So uh, maybe when this, when I've handed in the first draft and we're really moving it's along, I'll, other things will, <laughs> yes, I'll really be relieved and then and other things will start to happen. Because the other thing, I mean, changing the world, you, you like to say, I've seen, read all these things that I could, that you're a socialist or that you want to be an artist that represents the American political left. Well, I, I feel like I'm an artist of the American political left. I don't know no, one, I mean, no one artist could see, represent all of exactly. the various well, points of view. That's your use of words. So I, <laughs> I, I feel that I'm. Um, I want to be identified as uh, an artist of the left because I, I am. I mean, I'm, I'm consider myself a progressive person. I consider myself a left uh, person. My my way of thinking and looking at the world, the community that I feel uh, most deeply connected to, is is the the left and specifically specifically the American uh, left, um, which doesn't mean that I'm uncritical of, of my community. I, I belong to several communities, the Jewish community, the uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender community, um, the left, and America itself, the human race. And, you know, one feels uh, critical of one's family at the same time one uh, feels most uh, intensely oneself when you're um, in the context of, of your family or, or of a community group that, that, that feels like a family. Um, so, you know, I would never say that I represent the left in any particular way or that I can imagine any single voice doing that because there are, of course, so many different so perspectives. Yes. But, um, but I, you know, I like to think that the work that I do um, should be understood to come from um, a left perspective. And I think the people who read it um, with a sophisticated understanding of how complicated a statement that is will understand that the work can be complicated, that it's not intended to be a political broadside or, or a sort of simple-minded uh, propaganda for this or that cause. Right, it's just not a message. But, yeah. But um, how do you, you can't, do you, can you really write anything that doesn't, ha doesn't reflect how you feel? Um, about the world, all the different communities? Well, you can try to lie about things if you feel that there's some profit for you in, in lying about it, and, and, you know, good luck. I mean, I think there are people that do create work that they... Uh, screenwriters. Uh, that they <laughs> screenwriters, <laughs> filmmakers, playwrights, novelists, everybody. everybody yeah. um, you know, and you're always wrestling with telling the truth and lying. I mean, I think that in a certain sense, the biggest job of the artist is just to catch yourself at the various ways that you lie to yourself about the world and to try and sort of get past those defenses and neuroses that are basically fantasies that you've constructed that you've thought at some point in your life would protect you from something <laughs> terrifying. And you've kind of got to wiggle your way around those to get at something that resembles the truth or a new way of looking at the world or a new understanding of the world uh, that seems to have relevance to the world. But it's the truth that in you see or you think is the truth. Well, you always are aware of the fact that truth is, is relative and, and slippery. But I think that there are, you know, there's, 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 uh, 
truth no matter how vague or, or relative it might be and then there are things that are actual lies I mean there's there's you know what what uh, um, the Bush administration likes to refer to as the reality based community and then there's the Bush administration and I think that those of us who are still proud members of the reality based community know that we're or we're too we're too sophisticated to think well uh, I know what the actual truth is but I I have a sense I think of the general arena in where truth resides I knew for instance before the war in Iraq started that this was a bad idea yeah, but how did I, I knew that too how did we know that well because you sort of know various things that people who are now aware that that we've made a terrible mess and are trying to sort of backtrack and say uh, well it's a mess but I didn't know it back then but, but there are things that were lying there but, but it goes back way back deep into your soul that we knew it was wrong it, well I mean it, it does reflect it does, who we are to begin with yes in a sense I mean I think that in a way what I believe is, is a sort of a, um, a characteristic of progressive people of, of, of um, is, is a, a willingness to think a thought through um, and to try it's a hard thing to do but to try and think I mean and not everybody does this of course um, progressive people don't always do this but uh, you try and continue thinking until you reach a conclusion even if the conclusion is uncomfortable or even if the conclusion is costly to yourself um, and you know there was all this evidence lying around it was incredibly clear that Saddam Hussein was not uh, a great threat to anyone in the region that years of sanctions had destroyed the Iraqi economy already that there were uh, the evidence on weapons of mass destruction I mean looking at Colin Powell presenting that nonsense you to knew, the UN you knew, it you knew it was nonsense well anybody looking at it but why didn't more people know it well I think a lot of people just didn't want to look and I think a lot of people were um, paralyzed by uh, um, the determination of the administration um, a lot of people were paralyzed by um, a compliant press because I think the press has done much better since but during the days of the build-up towards the war you know behaved abominably and I also think um, we're paralyzed by our own powerlessness. I mean, the, the, our complicity in this, the, and I think we have a great, people on the left have a great responsibility for what's happened in Iraq. I mean, it's, it's our fault in a way as much as anybody else's because we've spent 25 years um, sort of scoffing at the idea that uh, electoral democracy can um, accomplish anything genuinely progressive. And we've sort of retreated into uh, um, very sort of twisty and interesting um, theories of ideology and of politics that uh, have given us permission to abandon, I mean, and sort of fantasies of anarchism uh, and revolution that have caused us to abandon, I think, uh, the, the kind of coalition between uh, ground, uh, uh, you know, sentiment on the ground for progress, demand on the ground for change, in the streets for change, and people who are elected to help make so that into in a, law. In other words, we haven't really paid, I mean, we have not played our role as a citizen. No, exactly. Right? We've abandoned the idea of citizenship. But and, and it's so, so funny that you mention democracy because who has this idea that you're supposed to take democracy and impose it on everybody, whether they, well, it's a, you it's, know, it just doesn't it's work. A, it's an appalling idea. But it, it comes to also to challenging, don't you think? It's it's the ability to stand up against the common opinion. I, I've read some places where you say, well, I'm not particularly courageous. But in a way, you are because I think people who are objecting to the the, the general consensus of, of positions and policies are can be they're very um, courageous when they buck the tide and I think that's what happened in the Congress well I mean very few of us in this country um, especially in recent years have had to uh, summon up the kind of courage that for instance let's say the lawyers in Pakistan had right, to, or the, or the, the right. monks in Myanmar Burma With the have personal had to summon threat up. against this well I mean where you really right. are you really are um, putting your life on the line I mean one of the great accomplishments of, of, of a, a pluralist secular democracy ought to be that you can work for change and it requires a certain kind of courage but that you don't have to risk your life to do it that you can actually get it done no, but, by doing things like but get more practical like the members of the Senate they voted for it because right. that was the popular feeling and for them their career was at risk not their life I mean and well, that becomes their life right and there, there's a great deal of cowardice there yeah. and I and in a certain sense I don't know how much um, Courage is actually uh, entirely a virtue in politics because if politics in a democracy is very is very sort of um, I think inherently 
um, sleazy thing like theater. It's <laughs> it's it's something where uh, the creation of certain kinds of illusion are, I think, part of the art of no, politics. I don't think it should be the art of politics. Oh, I, I think do. That's the corruption of politics. No, I see. I disagree I, with you yeah, about that. Right. I I feel very strongly that in in the business of getting <laughs> change to happen in a democracy where you have to work with people's opinions. Oh, definitely. Then you, you have to compromise. You have to learn. compromise, that's and right. you also have to learn ways of of shaping and and moving opinion, which will often involve involve the creation of illusion. I don't mean lying to people well, like, you know, that. we're engaged in secret programs right. no, of, of torture and wiretapping and we're going to lie to you about that or we're going to tell you that there are weapons of mass destruction when there aren't. That's criminal yeah. activity. It's, quite, it's when the grassroots are really 10 people and you but, talk about 100. Right. I mean, the greatest <laughs> politicians in our country's history, people like Abraham Lincoln, have, yeah. have had a, a, a kind of genius for understanding, you know, both how to listen to the people and also how to lead the people. And it's involved both a degree of incredibly uh, necessary honesty and also um, a degree of manipulation. But it's also a strategic and sense. It's a strategic yeah, sense. Well, You're planning strategic it. Is See, a we're nice not word putting it the same a... word, the way because there are sleazy methods of politics where you really get paid off. You take well, maybe money. sleazy is that's not. A, no, it's I don't mean. I certainly don't mean corruption. Yeah. Well, you know, but when we say things like strategy, we're sort of in a way sanitizing. I mean, there's a degree. I think there's a mistake that people make that politics. I mean, people. I think in 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 my community and your community make often um, that that politics in a certain sense should be an expression of personal purity and that you vote for people oh, yeah, as an no. expression of your See, own I'm personal older than purity. You I come from a different, it's very interesting, I come from a different generation, so I don't have that same sense of, uh, in, in the progressive sense. I'm a, a real politician. Right. And, and real politics is... And you is, need to have the act of public. I mean, look at ACT UP. Yeah. And how we had to respond if you were in the government, you had to respond to the people outside. Right. So that's that's what I'm, how I view it. It's an interesting generational... But I, I think. and I guess I use a word like sleazy. I mean, of course, I don't mean corruption. <laughs> but what I what I do mean is is although I've been studying recently the passage of the Thirteenth Amendment, which abolished slavery in the United States, and that was done by even on the part of Lincoln, an incredible right. amount of sort of like sure. bribery and trickery to That's get this, this immensely important bill, maybe the most important bill uh, ever mm -hmm. passed in, in in this country uh, through uh, the House and the Senate, and and it's. I mean, I think it's good to uh, to to think about the ways in which it, um, uh, the the road of of going from good intentions and 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 good ideas to actual uh, political accomplishment is not a straight road. Right. Right. Um, I think it's important to to think about that, and and I think that there's a big difference between um, a politician who has to do a certain amount of strategizing right. and somebody like Bush who's a and, criminal. And, and it's stage acting. I mean, Bella. Abzug and I used to work together all the time, and we used to uh, laugh. She'd say, the grassroots, I'd say, you really mean a few weeds, <laughs> because it was enlarging everything. You know, you have to make a movement in order to be able, when you're in the government, to respond to right. it. That's, that's what happens, right. I think. And, and, and I think that when you did, mention the Senate vote for yeah. to basically hand war powers over right. to Bush, which not only, of course, made it possible for him to go to war, but also guaranteed him a re-election. Well, and because, Bush was strategizing, because the whole that whole nonsense about going to the UN and Colin Powell well, but talking, that, See, that's, that's not strategy. Bad. We didn't uh, like it. Well, it's and that's not strategy. That's actually a violation a, of, of any criminal. number of laws. Right. So these people yeah, should all be really in prison, lying. yeah. Um, but but when people like Hillary Clinton voted, you know, uh, for something that she knew she shouldn't have voted for, she obviously knew that it was a terrible thing and it was despicable. It was cowardly. Although I admire her in many ways, that was a bad the thing to thing. do. The, the Senate did a terrible thing at the, at the time, and a few of them uh, were willing to say it in public. But part of the reason I feel that this happened is because for so many years, the progressive, the, the political energies of the progressive community, the political energies of the left, had not gone into getting better senators, um, you true. know, in office. So we we had people who would cave at a moment like that. It was that, so as many special to, interests that it were looking for what they wanted, yeah, and it wasn't and, any kind of a coalition. With many of us group. have, let's face yeah. it. Spent time running around talking about you know waiting for the for the days when when the revolution will come and there'll be some sort of you know unspecified vague giant change in everything that will have nothing to do with electing good representatives and good be, senators yeah. and we're not going to see it in our lifetime. Well, who knows? And who knows after the 20th century whether or not we, we even may, what? I'm sorry. Well, I mean. I'm not so sure what I think about violent revolution at this point. I'm not entirely sure that I've seen a lot of evidence in history that it produces anything that's particularly uh, impressive or stable. What I do believe is that, you know, for instance, with the civil rights movement in this country, that um, a lot of concerted action on the part of decent people through um, an electoral democracy can make 
you know, genuinely significant and, uh, change. And there's, you can see the evidence of evolution by the two candidates that are running for the Democratic right. nomination. And I guess the challenge to everybody is, is to keep that going afterwards. I mean, that, right, that, exactly. that really has become evolution. Well, the first challenge is to temper. make it happen. Yeah, and the then, first challenge is to get one of them. Right. Uh, possibly both of them into the White House, depending on what happens, but to get to get either Obama or Clinton in right. to make sure that McCain doesn't win, to increase the Democratic majority in the House and the Senate. And then you're exactly right. After that happens, our work isn't done. We have to stay Absolutely. after them to keep them right. honest. And, and then to keep, you go on to yeah. the Senate and the House and Which we didn't do when her that. husband was elected. Right. We got him in and, that was and it. we breathed a huge sigh of relief. And then we sort of sat back and that we weren't we weren't aggressive enough. I mean, to the point where um, he even sometimes challenged the lads that, you know, you guys have to sort of like r rise to the uh, occasion. And we, we didn't. We sort of allowed him to. Uh, triangulate excessively, and, and it's hard. It's very hard work to, to do that, but I think it's work that we need to reinvest in as a community. So. Do you, I mean, do you wonder, what I wonder about is how can somebody truly believe they're a conservative and other people truly believe, so I don't even use the word progressive, but liberal, but it's all right, progressive. How do we, how do we get to be so different if we're both sincere? How does oh. that happen? Well, I, you know, my feeling is, and this is unfair and irresponsible to say, but I, I genuinely believe that conservatism is, to some extent, a thought disorder. I've said that before. <laughs> I think that there's a, there's, a, there's a point at which you stop thinking. I mean, you kind of are willing to follow a chain of thoughts up to a certain point. You know, you start with a principle <laughs> that nobody's going to argue with, like, you know, self-reliance, that everybody should sort of, t when, you're in a, when you're a competent adult, you should take care of yourself. And then you think, you know, my parents came, my great-grandparents came from the shtetl, of you know Eastern Europe, they had nothing. They couldn't speak the language. They came here and they blah blah blah, and they took care of themselves and their family, and then their family. Da, 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 <laughs> and here I am. I'm this wonderful person. And and you're willing to think those things through, and they're all true insofar as they go. But then you sort of stop at a certain point, and you don't really want to think about, for instance, why. Um, new uh, populations of, of recent immigrants to this country are facing a very different set of circumstances and why, um, for instance, uh, racism has, has uh, a different uh, political valence than, let's say, anti-Semitism or anti-Irish feeling or anti-Italian feeling in, so, in, in so the 19th we century. There? Well, why? You mean why are some people able yeah, to think it yeah. through? I, you know, I, th I don't know. I think it's, it's just um, so amazing. Isn't it an uh, interesting kind of? Well, I think Amazing. it's a, I think it's a, I think on some level, fundamentally, it comes down to a kind of a psychological, I think that, uh, thing that there are people who are, who, who, um, uh, have an expectation, um, a genuine expectation of justice in the world yeah, and a genuine exactly. expectation of joy in the and world. dignity of people. And, and, and uh, the sense of their own dignity yeah. and, and the dignity of others yeah. and a sense of dignity that's not dependent on, so, uh, the, crushing of other people and, and empathy and, and, and empathy and does that come from does that part of it come from family well my friend Oscar Eustace who runs the yeah. public theater always says and it's, it's, that, that, that um, I think it's around the fourth century BC that the two things that emerge <laughs> simultaneously in the Greek city-states are theater and democracy and as Oscar says uh, it, it's not a coincidence that in point of fact theater asks us to empathize with other people on stage. It asks us to suffer yeah. with the people that we see suffer, as yeah. Shakespeare's Miranda yeah. says. And, uh, and that democracy, in a sense, asks the same thing of us, that we, that we can only um, uh, really have um, justice in the world with, with, a, with a, an extraordinary human capacity for uh, empathy. And that, uh, and that I think some people have it more than others. But you know, in a way, I don't really like <laughs> Thinking that way because it, we can also get hideously self-congratulatory yeah. and say, "Well, we're just nicer we're so people great. than they are," yeah. and we screw up all the time. We do, we and, do. But there is a, there's such a basic difference, and I just I, I never been able to quite get grasp why that happens. Well, I think I don't think um, in terms so much of, of pro, pro, progressive and conservative, but I think that 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 in any human community, there are probably going to be about forty percent. Of the, and this is a number that I've just arrived at from gut intuition. There's like 40% uh, people are, they're probably very neurotic and messed up, but they're sort of uh, really completely functioning people. They're sort of willing, to, able to go out in the world. They're not afraid. Uh, they don't lead with their fear. They don't lead with their anger. They, they feel at home enough in the world 
to, to look at the world, to sort of try and understand the world, and not afraid that the understanding is going to discombobulate them in some way. And then there's 60% that are a variety of people who are really nuts, and then a variety of people who are not nuts, but who are stunted in some way, who fearful, who fearful and angry. And, and those people are, you know, but, the crazy people are the crazy people, and then there are the Republicans. But, <laughs> the, uh, this election, this campaign is separating people so much by class. And, and attributing really very basic differences to those classes. And I don't really believe, I, I believe there's a way of not having that happen. I mean, I think there is certain obvious evidence of, you know, the use of the value of money and, and income and a yeah. job. But to really have basic beliefs that are different because you're from a different class, I don't know. Well, I mean, in a certain sense, it would be great if, 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 a, if a kind of class consciousness emerged that would be exciting because yeah. the class, I mean, it, in a way, I mean, Obama may not have said it with incredible felicitousness, but when he was talking about people who substitute ownership of guns right. And, right. and theocratic ideas about, you know, uh, life um, uh, for, for an understanding of their own disadvantages, I mean, as I was saying to you, I'm about to go down to Louisiana, which is ranked 50th in everything. Um, and is a state that has never been able to understand that you know that the, their hard the, the hardship of life in Louisiana, and and catastrophes like Katrina have everything to do with money and have everything to do with economic disadvantage and nothing to do with the things that Louisiana focuses on obsessively race and gay people and abortion and all of this stuff that's just you know these are not your problems your problems are uh, you know that you you've been you know uh, marauded and exploited. Um, for for uh, two centuries, and 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 if there was a way in which uh, a class-based understanding of like economic people said, you know, really, actually, I can buy iPods and I can buy you know mm -hmm. SUVs, but I'm in hock up to my eyeballs and I don't own anything, <laughs> and I'm unhappy, and my life feels meaningless, and I have no power, and the bridge that I'm going to drive to work on is going to collapse because nobody's inspected it and the cranes are falling. <laughs> you know, people were really willing to look at where money goes, uh, goes and, and, and who gets it and who doesn't and why. And how much do we need? Right. I mean, how you hear, much? <laughs> I, I heard John McCain on, uh, Tavis Smiley asking John McCain on the radio the other day and he's doing his Lost Forgotten Places tour and he said, and Smiley asked him very sensibly, you know, okay, but since you're a Republican, you don't believe in raising taxes, what do you have to offer any of these places? You're not, you have no money. To, and McCain Cain sort of feebly says, well, economic growth will make everything <laughs> good for what them. And it's like, complete nonsense. And it finally, if people would wake up to that and wake it's up to the realization that, you know, that, well, if we cut the capital gains tax, Tavis, we're going to just be, it's like, this you is your insanity. Refund. You're going to get, re you get your $300 check economy. Right. and go out and spend it, and the economy yeah. will come back to life. What, do you, how do you feel about all the criticism that uh, Jimmy Carter is uh, receiving these days for his intervention in the Middle East? Well, I feel um, great admiration for Carter, yeah, actually. It's embarrassing, I think, isn't I it, the, the response that there's been to him? Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, not not surprising, um, given the kind of noisemakers who are there ready and waiting to defend, you know, the indefensible. But I think that, I think that he's exactly right. Um, I think that there is no possibility, and in a certain sense, Abbas is saying this over and over again, there's no possibility of anything progressing in any way with, um, uh, without including Hamas in, in, in discussions. And of course you talk to your enemies. That's the fundamental meaning of, di of diplomacy, is that you go and talk to your enemies. You, you begin to negotiate with them and to, and to try and figure out some kind of possibility of common ground. And so I think that uh, this latest round of, uh, yeah. you know. Do you think, uh, don't you think there's a slight, I mean, there, there's, there are inroads being made into that supposedly solid American support for Israel's policy with uh, J Street coming and you vote, you were a founding member, weren't you, of Jews for Economic Well, I'm on the board of Jews for, I'm not a yeah. founding member, but, but I've now, been connected now with J Fridge. There are and more, there's more and more that you hear about now. I'm, I'm connected with this group, Bretzetic Shalom, which uh -huh. is Marsha Friedman's group, which is a really fantastic group doing a lot of lobbying and work to yeah. try and get people to, to rethink a, a, new, a new policy. And you just, you know, you realize, I mean, it's grotesque to see Bush and Rice running around at this point seven years into their administration, having done so much damage, I mean, uh, un incalculable damage, 
to run around thinking that in the last gonna have a peace five months they're going to be able to cobble anything meaningful together. It's, it's grotesque. It's obscene. And we're finding out now that the Bush administration gave Sharon permission to continue expanding settlements. I mean, it's, this is a very, very ugly um, dismantling. I mean, Clinton made a lot of mistakes. There were a lot of lies told. There was a lot of sort of misdirection in the peace in initiatives. But, but Clinton really worked very, very hard. The administration, Bill Clinton, worked very, very hard to try and begin to lay, I mean, serious groundwork for uh, Mideast peace, which this mm -hmm. terrible man and his terrible gang of, of you know, lunatics and criminals uh, has, has uh, undone. And, uh, you know, I'm, I don't know what will happen now. I think that, you know... Um, it's it's going to require some political courage. Well, immense political courage. And in a certain sense, Bush has made the United States so irrelevant at this point to, to the, the process. Well, to, well, to, to the I world. Mean, to the world, except <laughs> as, a, as a target for the world's hatred. But uh, but um, in, in, in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict right now, maybe a new administration can change this, but right now, clearly the Arab nations and Israel and Europe and Russia are going to have to be taking the lead because the United States has become largely um, a, 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 an yeah, obstacle. Uh, out of all of this coming out of you, there's also a great sense of hope, isn't there? Yeah, I mean, you know. I, you know yeah, come on, tell us. <laughs> no, I, listen. I mean, I'm I'm a, I'm a very patriotic person. I love the United States. I love America. I love being an American. I believe that our conflicts and our contradictions and our mistakes are the you know conflicts and contradictions of pluralist secular democracy, which is a big, messy, un, uh, manageable, ungovernable process in a lot of ways. And but I believe absolutely that that progress is made that more justice arrives. Um, it takes a very long time, and occasionally, tragically, blood is spilt on the way. Um, it's not an easy or, or painless process, God knows. But um, I think that, we, as we were saying uh, earlier, I think that, that, you know, you look at the... We're finished. Oh, we're done. <laughs> I want to say that it's such a delight to talk to someone who's so happy to be alive, which is what I oh. think you are. <laughs> oh, well, thanks, <laughs> and Good. I thank, And I'm glad that your vision is that it's going to get better, even though the, the road there is very difficult. I think these are yeah. exciting times yeah. that we're living in. Thank you so much. Sure, Emily. my pleasure. If there are any people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore, please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.